It's good to be back with you. I trust that you have been experiencing the Word of God becoming alive in your life as you're saturating in that Word and as God is using you week after week to link with your pastor in praying the Word of God into the atmosphere of your sanctuary and that you are experiencing powerful services in these days and that lives are being touched as we begin to move towards this revival time. In this session, I want you to turn with us to Ephesians chapter 2. We are looking, of course, at the passages that give us the uh, phrase or word heavenly realms. You'll remember it's used 52 times. There are 52 words, that is, throughout the entirety of the book of Ephesians that are not used any place else in the New Testament, which tells you that this book is really something else and has something special to say to us. And one of those 52 phrases or words that's not used any place else is this phrase, heavenly realms. And it's used five times in the book and it gives us the bone structure of the very book itself. Now, just to give you a little review quickly, we have looked at the first time it was used and that is in chapter 1, verse 3, where he says that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. You'll remember that what he's saying is that God sits in this state of awesomeness and greatness and power and as he, it's his aroma, you know, it's his cologne and as he sits there in the greatness of this power, this all emanates out of him. He is blessing us, speaking good things about us, speaking spiritual blessings into existence for us. And where are all of these spiritual blessings? He plainly tells us they're in the heavenly realms in Christ. In the heavenly realms in Christ. What a statement. Where are the heavenly realms? Don't think in terms of way out there. Don't think of terms beyond the atmosphere. Think in terms right here, right here, pressing in upon us, just at the end of our fingertips, just at the end of what we can do, just at the end of our ability, just at the end of what we're capable of pulling off. And when we come to the end of ourself, and we rest in Him, then we are dwelling in the heavenly realms and all of this begins to take place as He begins to flow His dynamic through us. So where are all the spiritual blessings? Hey, they're in the heavenly realms, the place of surrender, the place of giving up, the place of death, the place of crucifixion, the place at the end of yourself. Everything, every single one of us have got things going on, going on in our lives in which we are way in over our head and we have no idea what to do about it. Oh, every one of us have and are experiencing those kinds of things. Rather than beating your head against a brick wall that you can't move, oh, rest in Him, relax in Him, and let the blessings in the heavenly realms begin to take place in your life. That's the place He wants you. It's at the end of yourself, beyond yourself. This is the provision beyond us that God has given to us in the heavenly realms. You'll remember then there was the second place that he used this phrase, heavenly realms. And it's in the same chapter, chapter 1, only it's in verse 20. He's given an overwhelming prayer to us. And in the middle of that prayer, or at the close of that prayer rather, he gives us this phrase as a description of the mighty power of God himself that he wants to have working in our lives. And as he talks about this power, this is what he says, verse 20. The power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. From the dead, oh, from the dead. And seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. He says, here's this mighty power of God. Where is it? In the heavenly realms. And God sitting in this heavenly realm, speaking all these spiritual blessings into existence for you, has reached down and grabbed a hold of a dead Jesus, yanked him right out of that grave, and brought him into overwhelming aliveness, the power of the resurrection, and promptly seated him right at the right hand of his being, giving him this place of majesty and power at his right hand. Now, where is all of this? Where is Jesus seated? In the heavenly realms. And then he goes on to describe, you'll remember, where Jesus is seated in the heavenly realms. Far above, verse 21, far above all principalities, all power, far above all might and dominion, far above every name that you want to name, any place, anytime, anywhere. In this age or in the age to come, don't you see, he has this supreme position in the heavenly realms. 
and you can live in the heavenly realms. At the end of yourself, surrender, dead, living, not in yourself, your ability, your, your manipulation, your, your own reasonableness, but leaning on Him, resting, the sanctified life, the cross-style living, dead to yourself, in the heavenly realms, so all the spiritual blessings are flowing, and all the power of the authority of Jesus above every principality and every kind of force that comes against you. He has supreme authority over it all. Magnificent, isn't it? Now I want you to move to chapter 2. We want to talk about the third time this phrase shows up. And in chapter 2, you'll note he begins in verse 1 by talking, He made you alive. Oh yeah, you became alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins, you understand that. And every one of us, he says, have been. In fact, in verse 2, he says, We once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. All of that was going on in us. Hey, you remember that, don't you? In fact, he moves on to describe it further in verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Hey, we're no different than anybody else. We've walked where you've walked. We've been where you've been. You may look at us now and say, wow, but wait a minute. We've been where you've been. We've come from where you've come from. We are in the same position that you are in. It's no different between you and me. Hey, we've all been there. We all understand that. We've been dead in trespasses and in sins. But, oh, that's a great word, isn't it? You know how we use that word. We set up a contrast. We paint this picture over here, and then they say, but, and over here we give a whole different picture. That's exactly what he's done. Here's your deadness and trespasses and sin. Here's the conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh. Here's this awfulness. We were children of wrath. But, God, who in great mercy, because of his great love, wherewith he loved us, Wow, isn't that a magnificent statement? Look at it again. But God, who is rich in mercy, rich, rich in mercy, because of His great love wherewith He loved us. Now here it comes. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you're saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly realms in Christ. Wow, isn't that a magnificent statement? Think of the position you have in Jesus according to verse 6. This is what he wants for you. This has been his dream for you. This is his design and his plan for you. See, it's the same identical power that reached down and grabbed a hold of a dead Jesus and yanked him out of that grave and seated him right at the right hand of the Father. And that same God the Father has seen you. He saw, he saw you in death. He saw you in the deadness of your trespasses and sin. He reached down and grabbed a hold of you and yanked you right out of that deadness of trespasses and sin and said, well, what am I going to do with you? He's raised you from that deadness. And he said, I think I'll seat you right at the right hand of my being also. But then, what is at the right hand of his being? Well, Jesus. Jesus is sitting there. So how are you going to sit there? He said, I just think I'll seat you in Christ right there. And he plopped you right down in Jesus at his right hand. In the heavenly realms, you're sitting in Jesus. Wow, what a position you have. See, God has brought this into existence. Now, I know, we immediately begin to think in terms of the physical, and we begin to think, well, that isn't characteristic of my life, and I'm, I'm certainly not sitting in some high, lofty place with overwhelming authority and greatness. Oh, if you could see it in the dynamic of the spiritual realm, if you could see it with the spiritual eye, it would all become plain to you. Now, where is the heavenly realms? At the end of yourself. Hey, at the end of your own ability. See, this is not, oh, I've got this power and I'll go out and do it. No, you don't have this power and you don't have this greatness and you don't have this authority. It's in Him and it's in the heavenly realms. And that is the realm that's just at the end of yourself. When, when you die to yourself, 
When you come to the total collapse of yourself, when you're totally unable to do yourself, when you no longer operate out of yourself, when you're no longer manipulating and controlling for yourself, hey, when you give all of that up and you come to the place of death, then you step into the heavenly realms. All the spiritual blessings are there. Christ is there above all principalities and powers. And now you are literally seated in Christ in that same position at the right hand of the Father. And you dwell there moment by moment in His grace. Greatness. That is the beautiful picture of the holy life. That is the beautiful picture of the normal Christian life that God wants you to have. That it should be average for us. Not defeat, but victory. It's because we dwell in the heavenly realms. Now, if you are dwelling in Christ at the right hand of the Father, in the heavenly realms, at the place of your surrender, if all of that is really taking place in the spiritual vitality of life itself, did you notice that then you too are above all principalities and powers? See, Jesus, he says, according to verse 20, is seated at the right hand of the Father. And that place that Jesus is seated at is far above all principalities and powers, according to verse 21, chapter 1. Now he says in chapter 2, verse 6, you're sitting in Christ. So if you're sitting in Christ, what's true about His position is true about your position as you are in Him. And what is true about His position? He's far above all principalities and powers. He's, he's far above every name that can be named. You need to tremble no longer. You literally dwell in Christ in the heavenly realms. It's all yours. That should give us a whole new grasp on spiritual warfare. We are not anemic, shriveled up, powerless little people who have no resource at our disposal. No, we have been placed at the right hand of God the Father, sitting in Jesus. And all that's true about Jesus is true about you. When we've come to the end of ourselves, we've died to ourselves, then His resurrection is our resurrection. His power is our power. His life is our life. His dynamic is our dynamic. Oh, it's not ours as if we have it in ourselves. It's in Him and we are in Him. So I'm in Christ and Christ is in me and the whole thing is operating because we are in the dynamic of living in the heavenly realms where all the spiritual blessings are, where everything he wants for us he's placed. We are in Christ and we have this position in Jesus and we can move our world. Now again, maybe you want to say, well, what does this have to do with praying the scriptures and getting ready for this revival meeting? Oh, the Apostle Paul is trying to prepare us. See, he's building. He started out with the first time he used this phrase that God is speaking spiritual blessings into the heavenly realms for us. He's moved to the second time that Jesus now is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms far above all, all principalities and powers and names that can be named. He uses it the third time. Listen, you too have been raised from the dead by the same power of God. You are seated at the right hand of God the Father in Christ in this same position. Then he moves to this last time. He uses this phrase, which is chapter 6, and says in verse 12, Don't you understand that our warfare is not with each other? This is not, we're not warring against physical things. This is not about physical activities. Don't you understand what's going on? There is an unseen battle in the unseen world. It's in the heavenly realms. That's where it's really taking place. And if you're going to move your home, move your church, you're going to have to effectively move the battle in the heavenly realms. And how can that be done? Well, listen, you're seated in the heavenly realms. Well, listen, all the spiritual blessings that God wants for you are in the heavenly realm. Christ is seated in the heavenly realm. You're seated in Christ. Therefore, let Christ through you do what he wants to do in the heavenly realms and the war will be won. This is what it's all about. So you have an advantage. You have the victory. You have everything you need. Put on the armor of God and let's get with it. And as he comes to the climax of putting on the armor of God, he says, oh, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray that Word, pray in that Spirit. 
So an effective part of what goes on in the heavenly realms is all about this, this praying the Word of God, allowing the aliveness of the Word of God to flow through us into the heavenly realm and affecting it from the position we have in Christ far above all principality and power. Now you see, we really believe that the Word of God is alive that we're not dealing with just some writing, some historical writing. We're not dealing with Shakespeare or Reader's Digest level. That the Word of God has a life. It's a living organism and it's vibrating. It's hard to explain, but you see there's the living Word and there's the written Word. Oh, we believe in the living Word, Jesus Himself, but the living Word has an extension and that is the written word. So the written word is an extension of this living word, Christ himself. Now the written word derives its life from the living word. So it's not that we worship a book or it has some magic connotation to it or we can rub this book and it really does something magical. No, it's not that at all. It's that the living word, the dynamic Jesus who said, I am the truth, that truth that comes from his lips literally fills this book and that is an extension of him. See, when I grab your hand, I'm grabbing you. Why? You're not a hand, but your hand is an extension of you. You could cut off your hand and you'd still be you, and yet, your hand is you. Well, it's not really you. Well, it's a part of you. Well, it's an extension of you. See, when I grab the Word of God, I'm really grabbing Him. For He's not the Word of God. That is, He's not the Word of God in the sense of the written page. He, he's the living Word of God. And that extends itself into the written Word of God. And the written Word of God is somehow alive because it's an extent, extension of who He is. So when I get into this written Word and I begin to saturate in it and the concept that truth of that word begins to grip me and I begin to spill that truth into my world that affects the atmosphere that's beyond me which is the heavenly realms and I'm praying the word of God which has power in it because it's his word which is an extension of him so if you and I are seated in the heavenly realms and all the spiritual blessings are ours that God has spoken into existence and they're in these heavenly realms and we're literally sitting in Christ in the place of power and majesty in Him that we can literally sit there and spill through us the living word of God which literally goes forth into the war that's taking place in the atmosphere around us and in our sanctuary and battle is raged and we, are won we win because the word of God God does its work, sword of the Spirit will accomplish what it was meant to accomplish. That's what we're wanting you to do. In fact, you could take, this is only a suggestion, you can take any passage you want to for this time before we meet together again, but I would suggest to you that you might take this passage of chapter 2, verse 1, down through verse 6, 7, and 8, and that you might just pray that. You might pray that. That is, saturate in it. That is, write it down on a piece of paper. That is, uh, read it, look at it, grasp the concept. Let the truth of that passage get inside of you. This, this will not be done casually. No, no. This will not be done, well, I've read that and that's it. No, I'm talking about soaking it. I'm talking about going over it and over it and over it again. Asking God to teach you this passage. I'm talking about saturating in His Word until you get underneath what's actually said and you begin to mine out the jewels that are there. You, you begin to see the reality of what he's saying and you begin to let that flow in you and as it begins to flow in you, you begin to understand it and as you begin to understand it, you begin to spill it into the atmosphere. You live in the atmosphere of the word and when you're down grocery shopping, when you're driving down the street, you're just filling the atmosphere of your car and your grocery store with that dynamic word and you're literally affecting the the atmosphere around you in your community. Now you come to church on Sunday morning and you sit there and you're there to participate. You're the choir, remember? You're the choir for the pastor. And as you sit there, you begin to roll these concepts. Oh, you've been saturating the scriptures all week long. And you just begin to roll that scripture into the atmosphere because at, you're at the end of yourself, meaning heavenly realms. And you're seated in Christ and all the spiritual blessings are yours. And hey, you're sitting in Jesus in the majesty of the far above all principles 
pile of these and you're just rolling the Word of God, the life of it, into the sanctuary, linking with your pastor and the Word of God is doing its work and pushing the forces back and lives are being changed and revival is coming and it's all about praying the scriptures. Would you become a participator in that? You can do this at your job. Can you see a situation with your boss is all upset and there's some catastrophe that's taken place and everybody's in a turmoil? And could you just look at them and stand there and just spill the word of God all over them? Just spill the peace of Jesus in them? Ah, in the heavenly realms, in the heavenly realms. So that this literally affects the atmosphere around you. I want you to saturate in the Word of God. Get into practice. Because when we come for a revival meeting, oh, I want this to be second nature to you. I want you to sit there in your pew and I just want you to roll the scripture into the atmosphere of the sanctuary as we begin to share together in the preaching. We link together in the preaching of the Word of God. Thank you for your time.